the recording. Good morning. We're going to call the uh, March 5th Land Use Committee uh, to order. Present here today is Council Member Chang, Council Member Ashby filling in for uh, Council Member Diener, myself, John Cucciardi. We have uh, staff, Terry, Nick, and Brandy. So away we go. We'll roll right into our first presentation. We have some guests here joining us tonight talking about their voice and this request for a puppy mill ban in local stores. Awesome. So my name is Kim Stevens, if you haven't met me, and I'm the president of a nonprofit called Their Voice. I started it last year because I saw a uh, kind of a need for educating the public more um, and an interest in learning more about like where their puppies are coming from. Um, and in the back here is Leah Spalding, she's the vice president of Their Voice, um, and then and I'm Karen Moni, and I've been working with Tiff and I'm um, advocating for a ban on the retail sale of pets for quite a while. Cool. So, yeah, we've been working on educating the public, like you have public events and, like, fun stuff, and then all, because it's kind of a, a sad topic, and so we try to make other fun things, and we do fundraisers for, like, homeless pets and stuff like that, too. So today we're just going to show you PowerPoint and just try to educate you a little bit more about why this is really important for your city. Okay. You want to go to the video first? Yes, we have a really short video to show you. It, she says it much better than I ever could. <laughs> and it's not um, like your summer overly, um, yeah, because I know that's not fun. Yeah, there's no Sarah McLaughlin singing or anything like that. high-volume commercial dog breeding facilities which supply nearly 100% of real pet stores and online puppy retailers are substandard factors in which profit and maximum productivity take priority over the health and welfare of the animals. Although licensed dog breeders who sell to pet stores and distributors are regulated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the minimal federal standards do not ensure a healthy or humane life for dogs. In fact, they do little more than require food and water. These types of kennels can legally have hundreds, often a thousand dogs in one facility, and those dogs are allowed to be confined to cages that are only six inches larger than the dogs themselves, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for their entire lives. They are often deprived of exercise, veterinary care, and positive human socialization. Many have never felt the sun on their backs or solid ground beneath their feet. It's far from the life any of us would want for a dog. Because the bull a puppy mill can make a profit, no owners must cut corners in order to keep expenses low and profits high. So staffing, quality of care and nourishment, veterinary attention, and human contact all tend to be minimal, and dogs are routinely overbred and inbred in order to maximize the investment. For the unsuspecting consumer, this frequently results in the persistence of a pet with an array of immediate veterinary problems or harboring genetic diseases that surface down the line, well after the store's warranty or state loan law is no longer applicable, provided that particular state has such a law. This creates a financial burden on the consumer and results in many of these animals being surrendered to our already overcrowded shelters. Approximately one quarter of the dogs in shelters are purebred. This is not just a humane issue, but a consumer fraud issue as customers assume the animals they are buying at such a high price are healthy and of the highest quality, when in fact this is rarely the case. So while the retailers may benefit from the practice of buying puppies at a low price from mostly out-of-state commercial dealers and then selling them at a high profit, typically without first spaying or neutering them, it is the tax-paying public that pays to house and often kill unwanted animals in the community. Puppy mills are in business to supply the country. We estimate that there are about 10,000 licensed and unlicensed puppy mills in the United States, mostly concentrated in the Midwest. This mills produce roughly 2 million puppies every year. Meanwhile, 2 to 4 million animals are killed in U.S. shelters every year. These are not effective, unadoptable animals, but a surplus caused by the fact that there are simply not enough people stepping up to adopt them. It makes little sense to continue manufacturing dogs when so many have been sold for lack of space. All right, pretty concise. If you guys didn't know what a puppy mill was, that kind of explains it. Um, so PowerPoint, you know, and I have, I don't think there's enough, um, there's four packets, and it kind of uh, goes along with the PowerPoint, and you don't have to read it all here, but I just provided it for you guys to read later. 
Um, so this slide, you can see Teresa, sorry, if you're wondering who she is, the very far right there. Yes, that's her. Um, she didn't be here today. But I have to pull all the notices to for the Navy. <laughs> yeah. So she's a huge advocate, and when she was in California, um, she was a big part in helping pass these dams, and she learned that going city by city um, was the way that they eventually were able to pass a statewide dam, like from a grassroots level kind of approach. Um, but it took a lot of cities, you know, before they were able to pass it. Lots of uh, work by advocates like herself. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> so what we're asking, so we're asking um, for Fort Orchard um, to pass ordinances that are similar to the ones that have been passed in Bainbridge, Bremerton, and Palso. And I put in a copy of each of the ordinances um, from the city so you can kind of get an idea of how they worded it. Um, there's a few. It's, it's totally dependent on what your city um, decides to do. Um, so Paulsville was the most recent to, to pass this? Yes, they were actually the 250th city. Um, so um, we're the last in the county? Uh, you would be okay. in the county, yeah, because the rest of it is, um, yeah, King's Unincorporated and like Kingston, they're not, they're unincorporated, right? Yeah. So yeah, it would be the last city. Um, but since June 2006, um, more than 250 cities, including Paulsville, have passed it already. Um, and then um, dams are legal, and they've, they've definitely been at public site efforts to rebuild them. Um, and then who supports this initiative? So in your packet, um, uh, definitely local community members. That's why I'm kind of here, is because I'm representing all of the hundreds of community members that have reached out to me that have joined um, membership in my nonprofit to try to make this happen. Um, veterinarians, I have two really nice letters. Um, the first one is a woman veterinarian, actually, um, she lives in Fort Orchard. And the other one, I'm sorry it's addressed to the Policy City Council. I didn't want to make her change the, the top, but her message is still the same um, for you guys. Um, so getting a doctor's position on this is kind of important, I think, um, to make a decision. And then also we received letters from animal welfare organization leaders. Um, including Elizabeth Orr, who you just saw in the video, she sent you a letter personally, and then also um, Jenna Jensen of the Humane Society of the United States Puppy Mill Campaign. Oh, and Eric, um, he's the executive director of the Success Humane Society, so he sent you guys letters too. Um, and State Representative uh, Sherry Appleton has been a big supporter, um, and she also has included a letter of support in your packet. Um, and then your next, next slide, please. Thank you. So who does this ordinance affect? Um, it will affect pet store owners that are considering establishing a pet store here if they want to um, sell puppies from the puppy mills. Um, California, just remember, they passed a ban for all of their pet stores that are practicing inhumane models of business are all trying to move. So a lot of them are moving to Utah right now. Um, currently, you're unprotected, and they can move here and establish a, a great business, and then it would be very difficult financially, I think, for your city to do anything about it. Um, it also would affect brokers that they, they abandon animals from out of state to sell to the um, pet stores. And then um, it would affect pet stores that source from breeders um, that have a lot of violations um, with the USDA, but they still run because it's hard to enforce the laws. Um, there's, the USDA does have um, enforcers, but there's only 112 of them, and there's over 8,000 facilities, so the likelihood that they're able to visit these places um, and actually check the animals is pretty minimal. Um, and then in, with this current um, president, they're decreasing the budget for it 20 percent as well, so it's going to make it even worse um, for the animals until, you know, that changes and they get I know, that's kind of upsetting to me. So that's why I think we need to do this from a city approach because I think we can make a bigger change where we live and then if we can get, you know, we can go to each other communities, that's what I want to do. But I kind of want to make where I live safe first. <laughs> so, um, oh, and then I just want to make sure that I uh, emphasize that it definitely does not um, affect any small um, hobby breeders or responsible breeders. There's tons of great breeders out there, we're not trying to like eliminate breeds by any means. I totally love the fact that you could go buy, you know, a boxer or something that you really, you know, always wanted that particular breed. Um, it doesn't affect shelters or rescues either. So legitimate animal organizations it doesn't affect. 
Next. And that's a little cute doggy asking if you would consider this. Um, and so we can, if you have any questions at all, I brought some local experts to help me here. Um, I don't know at all, but if I don't know anything or they don't know it, I, I know how to find the answers for you guys. Um, I just wanted to give you all the information to make it easy for you guys, because I know you have a lot of other things on your plate to, to learn about on a daily basis. So. I don't know that I have any additional questions. We were received testimony you know, a couple times over our last couple of council meetings, so thank you for that. And honestly, for today, I think it would just be a matter of staff. Yeah, I think we just could if, put if the committee wants to move forward, we should take the example ordinances and then the attorney have the attorney okay. put together a draft and bring it back. So, I, I personally um, would like to see a town hall on it. I would like to see public input. Okay. Um, before we, um, you know, perhaps we could have a work study first, but we um, we need a, a, a visible opportunity for other people to, to testify. So, That's what we did in terms of... Can we coincide that with the council meeting? I yeah. don't know that we need a separate town hall just on this topic. Oh, I do. Did it happen in the other cities? No, the Bainbridge passed it on a consent agenda, mm -hmm. but nobody even talked. They just oh. automatically agreed yeah. to yeah. say. Mm -hmm. But Bremerton, but Bremerton yeah. did do, uh, we had a great meeting where we opened it up to any opposition. Nobody appeared. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great to allow that if that were to, you know, be the case. Um, and then Paulso also, they had a meeting, but then before we were able to testify, they said, we don't even want anyone to testify. So it was almost like a consent mm -hmm. agenda, but we all were there to testify just in case. Um, so it's up to you guys, yeah, definitely understand that. Yeah, it, that is the drafts are written from the other cities are not land use regulations. They don't go through the process of amending a development regulation. Council could hold an option on public hearing or a, um, or, or some sort of other public meeting in. You know, it's, it's really I would urge the opportunity for input that you're suggesting, but I would also urge that it be coincidental with an existing council meeting during the public hearing portion um, to certainly give people that opportunity to talk. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't do a special step in. I tend to leave that way as well. Well, I was just thinking we, if we had, in mind it's a little more global than that, because I think there are two or three other issues mm -hmm. that we've considered having a town hall for, and I was thinking this might be an opportunity to, you know, have a uh, more informal, and, and there were two or three other things I know that we had talked about. Someone had, a citizen's group had come forward and asked about the bad plastic bags in the area. Um, you know, so there were just other things that I thought we could have a more informal to talk about. Well, we can take it up to the next uh, yeah, work study work session study. and determine yeah. how to... Mm -hmm. move, move this forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll. Um, I think we can take the lead on this, Randy. I'm sure you're happy to. Yeah. Have a seat at the secretary if you can send this to the attorney. Well, group. and I think you it might be important to bring forward the current code that's already in place, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm assuming it would just be repealed or modified based on whatever so that ordinance is. So. Okay. The ordinance will go to Sharon and it will be a work study item. Yeah, I think the okay. beginning for, we can probably make the March work study meeting. That's pretty nice. Okay. Uh, two weeks. Two and a half, actually. I think it has to be two nights. Or tomorrow, Sunday. Right. Yeah. Okay. Two weeks. So any questions I can answer for you? No, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. so what is the, just so, um, you know, when this is going to come up again, the, uh, that'll be the 20th of March for work study. And, and then from that meeting, we'll determine whether whether it would be a public hearing. And I think by April 10th would be the first date we could get a notice in the paper if we want to have a public hearing at council. If there's a separate uh, town hall, um, we would have to schedule that as well prior to taking action. Cool. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it so much. Absolutely. Um, and if you do have any questions that come up, uh, you can email me. Terry has. Um, and so, I think. Perfect. Thank you guys. I hope you have a wonderful yeah. um, time. We're putting this together. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And then I saw those documentaries, Dog by Dog. I saw Oh, you got them. Okay. Um, were you you're returning them to us? The council members? Yes, yes. Thank you. Oh, good. You know, I think we're going to donate to the library. Okay. So, yeah. 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 Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Have your sunny Monday. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. Good. <laughs>
Okay, let's move into item number two, Mr. Bond, Vision 2050 Scoping and the City Response. Well, I, I guess um, this is really more of a free-form uh, discussion about what our comments ought to be, uh, if any, and sort of getting into the, the letter-writing portion of, you know, of this topic. And obviously, we have shared a draft uh, bulleted list that is, is really intended to be something that would be reformatted as uh, a four- or five-page letter with our comments. Um, but if we want to go in a different direction, there are certain things in here are, um, are too uh, assertive or, or off-topic from really what is a, a scoping notice um, or a scoping comment letter. We can certainly shorten this. We could also, rather than looking at the goals and policies, if Forrester really wants to take the position that we really have an idea of how much we would like to grow between now and 2050, um, and just sort of backing into the goals and policies rather than focusing on the goals and policies, we could say that, you know, Port Orchard is comfortably able to accommodate this many more people than, you know, we're supportive of any alternative that doesn't result in more than this type of number. So really, I think we have to we have to pick a direction for our comment letter as to whether we're going to focus on the goals and policies of the region or more locally on the impacts of Port Orchard and then um, and then get this back to the city council a week from tomorrow to have our last council meeting before the letters are due. I, I like the idea of, of first looking at it through the eyes of Port Orchard. You know, I think we need to be wary of, of not, you know, what the county's doing. But you know, I think we're here to, to look at what's best for Fort Orchard moving forward. And um, a lot of this stuff in here, you know, the only thing, the question I have, and I know Beck has brought this up too, is this whole uh, small city threshold. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something that we point out more than just for an example. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe we, we make that a little more assertive in our, in our language to them. Uh, so saying that they really need to, to figure out this small large city break and whether you know whether we're reclassified or whether the, the target moves that's you know, that's it. And I think you'd have to see the target move. And I think behind that we're still that we still feel that we are a small city, that we are not trying to be a big city. And I don't know but I think that's what I heard from because I think that's the sense that I had too is that we want this to be a small city. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how you would work that. Well, it just seems to me that that That's threshold should move because yes. it's 22 uh, is a pretty low well, yeah. bar for it. striking distance. Yeah, it's the striking distance. Well, that, that's not only population, but that population is one of the things. So, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're just about there. Um, I guess I have a little different take on it. Um, Vision 2050 will um, encompass a lot of things that will directly impact it, or at least um, personally impact it. So I'm not sure we want to miss on this. Um, mm -hmm. This is our opportunity to talk about it. I think the number one thing is the, the review of the city designation. The other thing, when they open that up, they may not only change just the population employment numbers, but they could change the percentage of um, where right now it's eight percent for a small city, and they could change that on it. But that I think is a critical thing for Port Orchard to look at, at. And how can we stay um, and keep? the feel of a small city, but absorb the population we need. And when we get into that discussion, we have to remember that this is a regional plan, and there are several cities in Pierce County and Gale King, or in King County that they did their comprehensive plan this last time. They were planning for more growth than um, they were actually allocated, and they got their comprehensive plans rejected. So, which was made them ineligible for a um, round of transportation funding grants. So, when we open up this piece, don't think it's going to be a casual conversation. 
Right. I think that there seem to be a lot of jurisdictions that are very interested in it. Mm -hmm. But I think it's one that needs to be had. Mm -hmm. This conversation needs to be had. Uh -huh. The other thing that I think is really important in this comprehensive plan, or this vision 2015, is to complete the center's work. They haven't completed the center's work yet. And, what, and, and our concern on that is military centers. So those are things that I think, the other thing that I think is real important to Port Orchard, whether it's in a regional area or just a county-wide area, is the concurrency. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can, I think we really want to focus or, you know, mention that. And in the current Vision 2040, they talk about a, uh, and I don't know if they ever did it, a regional level of care. I don't think they have. I don't think they have either. So that's another thing I wanted to bring up about this is um, to give us a status report of what they did and didn't do that they were supposed to do out of Vision 2040. I completely agree with concurrency because what I'm thinking there is that we are unique in the county and that so much of the UGA is outside of our control. And so we have the county developing um, urban level density with really crappy transportation. Mm -hmm. And I think that affects us more than Palsa, who's completely annexed to UGA and Bainbridge and the government. So I think I would move that all well, it's not number one, number two. Well, in region, I think, for, I think in the county. In Snohomish and Pierce County, that is also very pronounced. Like, when you go out to Marysville and you see what what is happening in unincorporated Snohomish County outside of Marysville that is pumping traffic through uh, through a city like Marysville or in Puyallup, going out towards Graham and South Hill. Um, I mean, the amount of growth that the county is able to pump through the system because of varying levels of service standards is enormous. And I, and I think that's the biggest thing that is causing the region to grow in a way that is inconsistent with the, the vision, which is uh, really aimed at sort of containing the, the outward growth and kind of filling in the existing uh, urban areas. So from a, a regional policy perspective, I think that is, that is the biggest tool that's at TSRC's disposal to, to, to sort of get growth to, to go in line with this, this strategy, which is, you know, to a large extent, focused on protecting the environment in rural areas. So I'm, you know, I, I agree. I think that should be a, a you know, a main theme of, of the letter is, is how do we use concurrency to make sure that things sort of align with what we, with the path that we we've chosen for ourselves. And I think we need to be aware that um, when we talk about this at KRCC, we need to get pushback from the county. That may be something that has to be just in our letter and won't come out of a KRCC letter. Mm -hmm. But I think the other cities would probably agree with us and Stainbridge, who this isn't an issue for. Um, so the only other city then is Pulsa. And it's Bremer. Well, Bremer is not at the table. Yeah, correct. So anyway, so that's, so that those are things. And then the other piece that's important to me is financially. I mean, with all this growth coming in, and we talk a lot about transportation infrastructure and transportation funding a lot, but the federal funding goes through the SRC. But we need to have, um, and I don't know if it comes out of this document, a closer look at funding sources for the rest of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that that would be within the scope of vision, except as it relates to establishing goals for the region. Right. And then potentially the way that you implement that is by when you're evaluating applications for transportation planning, you look at what cities have put policies in place and what cities haven't. And you, you know, it's a carrot and stick approach to fiscal responsibility. Yeah. But I think it's important to discuss that in the context of this needs to be built into the goals of all three alternatives that are considered, um, as opposed to this is part of, of how we're, you know, how we're allocating growth, which is really how the alternatives are going to differ. Um, the other, the other big thing that I think the city may want to weigh in on in terms of regional policy is how do we want the region to grow, and do we feel that certain types of entities should be taking more growth? than others as a, a regional policy, and specifically, you have ST3 where you're building light rail to, you know, up into uh, all the way to Everett and South Tacoma, 
do the do regional centers that are in proximity to this massive investment that's being made in this new alternative, do they need to take a greater share of the growth because they have this investment? I mean, are we do should we leverage that investment and basically require for the SRC plan certification that those cities served by light rail actually plan for significantly more growth around those light rail stations? Um, and uh, I think along with that, though, they're going to have a stronger argument for getting grant funding when it comes to actually building infrastructure and support that growth, but that sort of takes other cities that don't have that infrastructure off the hook for accommodating as much. It, it, just my feeling on that, it seems that the amount of money that's going into FT3, that, 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 needs, that needs to be maximized. The use of it needs to be maximized. And if growth is along the FT3 spine, that should eventually take some pressure off of I-5 because those people should be. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of leaning with what Nick is saying, is if it's denser along that spine, that may be less that are coming our way. Yeah, I, I think a comment along the lines of, you know, 50% of the additional growth from 2040 to 2050 should be specifically at, within a quarter mile or a half mile of these ST3 stops. I mean, you should really require that these cities zone in such a way that it's going to um, maximize the use of that, that infrastructure so that people can not drive and have a really reasonable alternative to driving, which is going to extend the uh, lifespan of our existing capacity. What you hear a lot from, like, Kent, because Kent has an ST3 stop, is their... Um, the difficulty they have with parking is people drive in from all over and take up all of their parking, and then their residents um, don't have any place to park or can't even get in the parking to take FT3. So FT3 has created, um, you know, just a chain reaction of other issues, which would all need to be addressed. But yeah, so, so maybe the comment is that we should be focusing growth along the FT3 corridor and implementing growth strategies that really avoid a park and ride strategy in favor of a live, walk, ride strategy. Oh, excellent. Right, you, yeah. You're looking at a multi, multimodal uh, as it already is. Yeah. But it's seamless. The term they use down in the Bay Area when I was working on San Francisco Bay water taxi things, it was called seamless multimodal transportation where somebody could take their bike to a bus stop, go to the bike on, get from the bus then to the water taxi and water taxi in San Francisco. Um, because otherwise you're right, you have the unintended consequence of the parking issue, which is kind of the unintended consequence of the worker driver program the shipyard has. You drive around the rural parts of Kitsap County and you see all these kind of illegal, problematic parking areas where people are parking in these dirt areas and all the streams and, you know, and it's like 10 or 12 cars because that's where the worker driver bus lets people off and then it becomes a problem for that particular neighborhood and they're having that same problem up at, up at the ridge, for example, or we just parking there around the park and so you end up with these pop-up non-compliant parking spaces. So, yeah, parking is is problematic as an unintended consequence. Right. Then you go the other way, too, the pendulum swings, and if you had enough stops where people actually could walk, mm -hmm. it's going to take you 90 minutes on the light rail to get from Tacoma to Seattle and people are going to right. just drive. Right. Well, it's faster on, it's faster on the sounder than it is on the light rail proposal. Right. The light rail really from Tacoma is going to provide service to the airport, and beyond that, it's going to be better to write the, uh, the train to downtown. Right. What I mean, it's so, so kind of catch Yeah. What's silly about, yeah. about Lakewood right now is you can't get to the airport from there. Yeah. That's all put down. Yeah. But they have a bus. But so anyway, um, if we don't want to include everything that you've bulleted here, I think review of the city, the city classification, mm -hmm. concurrent thing. Military centers. Yeah, finishing that center. Yeah. And I, I think it's it's not only military centers, but it's also in the goals and policies recognizing the importance of the military and tribes in the Fort County region, which are totally yeah. on that center. Yeah. 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 Ye
vision. Yeah. And then taking advantage of that. What, what about the other thing that I don't think we've touched in here is we've talked about what a quarter should be classified from small to large and whether the geography changes. Do we have any, you know, I threw out some ideas about are there additional geographies that ought to be considered so that we are more targeted in how we allocate this growth? And, you know, I think, I think that, uh, large cities served by high capacity transit are maybe different from other large cities that aren't served by high capacity transit. And do we look at, you know, rural centers, and this isn't an issue here, but um, if you look at Snohomish and Pierce County, you have these satellite cities that are out there, and do they really need to be on the hook for the same type of growth that closer in cities are? And do we, do we as a city actually care about that? Um, I mean, I'm more concerned about us maintaining our small city designation as whether they're going to mm -hmm. raise the threshold Talking about that before we arrive, or how we how we do that is I'm not sure. But the other thing I want to I just want to say this out loud. Our building our infrastructure right now, the water and sewer we need, is contingent on growth. We need the hookup fees. We need the impact fees to pay for that, and. We also want to know, as I stated before you got interrupted, some of the comprehensive plans for your jurisdictions in uh, East Pierce County and East Kings County, their comprehensive plans were rejected because they were requiring too much growth. They were, DFOC uh, was saying, you can't grow above this. Right. So we also want to be careful that we... I don't know how that lives. Right, that we are given enough growth to meet our economic needs to provide the infrastructure. And, and maybe that maybe you tie that to concurrency to say that these are minimums that you have to plan for and that you can go above this provided you adhere to a regional transportation concurrency standard and that you're not, you know, you're not, uh, I guess, causing critical failures to regional infrastructure as a result of, of your choices. So, so Port Orchard can grow above that, but it's, it's based on the fact that we would have an adequate standard and that the county would have an adequate standard as well to, to at least discourage growth that's going to cause major tra traffic problems. There's more than traffic, though. There's sewer and water, too, mm -hmm. that, we, that we have the capacity in our, in our system yeah. to facilitate that growth. Mm -hmm. Because so we, seem, we seem to be able to get that wall more right now than mm -hmm. transportation. The other issue with that well, is that you're great. <laughs> the other issue is that sewer treatment plant that's on Queen Anne or wherever it is. Magnolia, yeah. Magnolia, when they have, um, when we have storm conditions, because their storm water drains right into. Deer. There's sewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's sewer. Yeah, it's an overflow. It's an overflow, and it ends up on Big Ridge Island. You know, it comes right out. And so we want to avoid. So there's a need for there wasn't good planning on that type of thing. We separated our systems long ago. Seattle hasn't done, and nor are they required to do, you know, the things that we have to do with our stormwater permit. And I think that's, it should be. I mean, I think they have more impact on Puget Sound than Port Orchard does. That's for darn sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why the concurrency and the, mm -hmm. in, the infrastructure besides transportation is pretty critical to us. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's that's really good feedback and should help me format what I've got now into a, a letter format and then bring that back to you. And um, I had planned on working with Scott, who is the chair of this committee, on kind of finalizing a draft for council, but in his absence today, um, you know, I, I think I need to work with somebody on drafting this letter, whether it's the mayor or, or one of you, um, you know, do you want to, does anyone want to participate in this? I'd like, I, I can put it in the letter for now. I mean, I'll read it, I'll definitely read it, but okay. I don't want to be the driver of this policy. It's not active, it's not an administrative function, um, mm -hmm. but I'm willing to, I, I guess as a result of the council meeting on the, what's the term? Is that our... Mm -hmm. No, the uh, 13th. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to have something that's in its final format that can be recommended or that the changes are very minor and yeah. specific so that I can get it fixed and get it in the mail um, without 
having to do a whole lot of editing. And Beck and I need some talking points for tomorrow, too, because we're going to KRCC. Okay. And I think we may have them here. Now, I'll plan on working on today. Right. Because I, I emailed you both the original, yeah. or our first a starting point letter from KRCC, and there, I really wanted to talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And I will you not be at the after this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I have that eleven o'clock at some board meeting. Here, this is board meeting tomorrow. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and I will be at the chair. If you need Nick or I any of those board meetings, let us know in advance. There's an agenda item right now. Want to prep before? Want us to be in attendance? But I typically I used to attend them and then I stopped because yeah. it was really a waste of my time. Yeah. Um, and if you, if there's a specific need, please let me know or not. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, just for time, get a long agenda. Let's jump up to number five, and let's get just with Nick here. I know some fresh heads of our stuff, and then we'll come back to three and four. Is that okay? Yeah. If we can do five and six. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, the um, so council is required to adopt the comprehensive plan docket for 2018. We had a number of applications submitted um, either because council has initiated has agreed to initiate those based on what we brought to your attention in January or because citizens had submitted uh, individual amendments. And so we're going to ask you to basically ratify the docket for 2018 and then it goes to the planning commission for a few months and should come back to you in, in probably June uh, for final adoption. And that's the nice thing about that is it'll be done before we go into budget so that um, hopefully all the capital facilities issues are worked out um, prior to to the budget process. Um, we can always amend the comprehensive plan again too as part of the budget adoption to deal with the capital facilities issues. But Terry, do you want to um, walk through the applications since you've been yeah, um, more involved in this? So we have two text amendments and three text specific or land use map amendments. Um, I'll just go through these in order. I didn't include um, the information on the text amendments because I think those are pretty self-explanatory. It's the annual update to the PIP, and then we are adding um, the Bethel and Sedgwick quarter, quarter right-of-way acquisition plan to Appendix D of the comp plan, which is all the documents that are incorporated by reference. So I think these are pretty... Well, um, for the for the land use map amendments, two of them are city initiated amendments based on information that we received um, from property owners and other um, concerned parties about a couple of issues out here. Um, one is the Crawford Road property um, that is of concern, and this is this actually went to land use a few months ago. Um, just talking about what our our position should be, what our options are here. These are a number of properties. Um, on Crawford off of Bethel. This is a, a dead end private road, um, substandard. There's been tons and tons of enforcement issues out here. And unfortunately, because the properties are all currently zoned commercial, um, it's very difficult for anyone to do anything to maintain, improve, expand um, the vacant parcels. There's a couple of vacant parcels, no one can build a house on them, even though this is strictly a residential neighborhood. We talked about this in a yeah, yeah, we did, yeah. So this is what you know. What we've proposed to do is simply to go ahead and rezone these um, from commercial back to residential low 4.5 to give people some incentives to improve their properties, fix them up, um, clean them up, and perhaps even have some new development out here. Um, the other one that the city initiated amendments is changing eight parcels that are along Old Clifton from um, industrial, urban industrial employment to residential high R20, thinking that these are more appropriate um, to residential. Is a ravine that separates them from the industrial park? Yes, yeah, you can see on both maps with streamlines, and where we're proposing to rezone is just the areas that are on um, the side facing yeah. old person, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they will have easier access and can actually some of the technology combined for a larger multifamily residential development. What does that look like in time this, you know, fifteen years from now when Clifton was a four lane road and started to get data out of there? We need to make sure that our road frontage improvements required tend to be back far enough that we're not buying buildings. Yeah, we'll we'll um we would evaluate the transportation impacts of this project. We already have on our six year tip the need to pedestrianize old cliffs in between the corner woods in the city. And so presumably some sort of frontage improvements would be required as part of this project. I don't know that 
widening Clifton, adding lane width is is in our even our twenty year plan. We we'll probably turn lanes in pedestrianization. Yeah. There's 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 one time when when Clifton was anticipated to be the next commercial corridor from Skia. It was anticipated to be a three lane continuous with Kirk Evans sidewalk. And then Skia died on the sense of the race track and all that. Clifton has changed back now into a rural, so that's why we're looking at the pedestrian connectivity. Right. It'll stay rural. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a, depending on the size of the apartment complex, you're going to need turn pockets, definitely. Cause, you know, yeah, you'll have turn lanes, but you won't have a continuous. Yeah. yeah, there's uh, multiple ingress and egress is also there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there one? How many parcel owners are there? Uh, three or four individual okay. owners. They've had a checkerboard of ownership. It's okay. weird where one owner is in between a guy who owns two other properties on either side. So, uh, so uh, there's an agreement between two um, combined properties where they own mm -hmm. certain lots. Is the um, pocket park in our comprehensive plan? And if it's not, we need to make sure it gets in here so that we can use some read money for the Rockwell Pocket Park and and the uh, yeah we can. I mean, uh, the amendments to Appendix B are on here. Um, we can always fix Appendix B, which includes the park plan as part of this. Okay. Um, I think it might be. I just well, I think it is sure that we the right. the yeah, we put the concepts in there and Mark's got some. Swag for for numbers. So you know, I just want to make sure we've got the three hundred thousand from the legislature. We're probably going to need to supplement that a little bit. I want to make sure we can use free money. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, the final one. There's one other amendment that was actually a privately initiated amendment off of uh, Orlando. This is near the Overlook Apartments that are currently under construction, but up above those where they're seeking that zone. Um, and so that's the only thing you haven't seen before, but I don't, don't see any reason why it can't be considered and, you know, we'll evaluate that as part of the, the comp time review process. So what, yeah, so what we're looking for is just that the land use committee is recommending that the council um, adopt this docket for 2018 and send the the planning commission for review, and it, you can always deny any of these when, you, when it comes back to you for adoption, but just would at least start the review process. Uh, the property on uh, Overlook, is that the ones that are taking advantage of our um, tax credit? Yes, yes, but this area is not within the tax abatement area. Okay. I'll bet they ask for something. Okay. Any other deliverables that you need out of this next? No, I just I uh, had not that all of you are good moving this forward. Yeah. All right. Will this go to the next council meeting for approval? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, one of the next two. Yeah, I can go to the next one. Okay. Okay, the next item that we have for you, we wanted to give a presentation to the committee here that we're also planning on giving to the planning commission tomorrow night. And as, um, as I mentioned previously and, you know, six or eight months ago, the next step in our code updates, now that we've completed design standards and we've completed our permit processing chapters, is to really look at overhauling our zoning code to give us really the toolbox that we need as we enter the sub-area planning uh, phase of, of comp plan implementation. And so we, um, we have started down a path, and then uh, in January we were alerted to a document that was prepared by HUD. Um, for a, a community in Idaho, and we think that we found an outstanding model zoning code to use uh, as the basis for a zoning code update for the city. And so we wanted to know it, it's a form-based code versus a conventional zoning code, and so we wanted to walk you through kind of the differences between what we have and what a form-based code looks like. And um, so this presentation is fairly short, but should uh, help you understand that. And so you know that in Title 20 we have our zoning standards, um, our comp plan includes a whole variety of goals that talk about housing affordability, diversity in housing choices, providing all, you know, alternative uh, living situations, and also emphasizing the quality of development through things like design standards, which we have now adopted. Uh, and so one of, our, one of our challenges in reviewing development is that 
our zoning code is really hard for engineers when they're submitting subdivisions. They're constantly either requesting uh, lot size deviations and trying to do lot averaging, and there's a net density calculation, and everything is very focused on the number of units per acre rather than the actual form that results from the the uh, development approval. So our um, we wanted to use our R8 zone as the example for discussion here. We have a maximum density of eight units per acre, which is a 5,400 uh, square foot minimum lot size. We have a 33 foot building height uh, and just standard setbacks for that zone with a 75% impervious surface coverage. The interesting thing is that despite having six setbacks and lot sizes and height limits, we allow single family detached houses, single family attached houses, which would include duplexes or townhomes. Um, we have, uh, we allow accessory dwelling units, home businesses, assisted living centers, daycare facilities, schools, parks and trails, and utilities. And so when you go back and look at these standards, these are all written based on single family housing development, yet we allow all sorts of other uses which don't really fit into the, the standard that we have. And so R8 is our, our largest zone in the city by area. And um, I, I think it's where we see most of our current development occurring. Um, so in terms of a minimum lot size, you know, one of the questions we wanted to ask is, you know, how much land is really needed for a townhome or a house that has an alley versus a house that has a driveway in front? Um, or a house with a three-car garage, if you've been out to McCormick Parcel B, there's a lot of big houses with three-car garages on relatively small lots, um, and how much would be needed for an assisted living facility or a duplex. And then, likewise, we allow 33 feet for all buildings, but do you really want somebody to be able to build a 33-foot shop in their backyard as an accessory structure uh, in addition to a 33-foot house? The... Um, we did some analysis on what's currently being built in the city. We have actively under construction 50 single family detached houses and 38 apartment units in two buildings. That's the Overlook project up behind the movie theater. Um, the average lot, the average size of the house uh, under construction is 3,400 square feet. Okay. Right. The house. Mm -hmm. Big house. And most, a lot of those houses are 4,000 square feet. Okay. They sure don't look like it from you. <laughs> yeah, they're large. So with a with a minimum lot size of 54, 45 square feet and a maximum lot coverage of 75 percent, you know, are we surprised that most houses are about 3,000 square feet in area because we're allowing for, a, you know, I don't know quick math what 75 percent of 5,400 square feet, but I mean that's almost. 3,000 square feet of a lot that can be covered, and then when you go up two stories or even three stories in some cases, that can be a, you know, a pretty big house. Um, if that's the market, well, and, and, but at the same time, what incentive would somebody have to build a two-bedroom house when they can build a house of that size? I mean, is it, is it an efficient use of land for a developer to, no. to underbuild? And that's, right. that's really the key. So the... Um, we looked at what's currently existing in Port Orchard. We have 119 homes for sale as of uh, some point last week. There's not a single townhome, duplex, or cottage housing, or condo for sale in the city. It's all single family. And then, of course, there are apartments for rent um, all over the place, but there, there really isn't a, a great diversity in housing types that are available for somebody specifically looking to purchase property. Rockwell condos don't even make it to the market. It's Somebody hears that somebody's thinking about selling and yeah. it's sold prices. So what I'm hearing is there's no affordable housing. It's not just affordable housing. It's so if you want to buy something, you've got to buy a house, and not everybody wants to buy a house. Mm -hmm. So um, we also looked at what you know, what's the mix of houses for sale. There's three one-bedroom houses, six two-bedrooms, 65 three-bedrooms, and 39 four-bedrooms, and eight that are five-plus bedrooms. And so you're getting mainly three and four-bedroom houses that are being constructed, and so... Uh, is this city limit or is this up or stop it that? This is city limit. Yeah, I think wow. we... Yeah, we drew a... Okay. It, it doesn't have to search by city limit, but you can draw a line on the map around the city that will tell you what, what's okay. available within that boundary. So it's pretty close to the city limits. Um, the smallest new house constructed that's for sale, for, you know, in the last four years, it's 2,200 square feet, so nobody built anything smaller than 2,200 square feet for a new house in Port Orchard. Um, and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath house. Um, 
So when we went on our urban design tour, I wanted to bring you back to some of the examples that we saw. This is a, a house that was built in Mill Creek. It's a 3,000 square foot lot, 1,500 square foot house, three bedrooms, two and a half baths, single car garage, and an extensively landscape development. And so it's fairly attractive despite the small lot houses. Um, we went to High Point. Uh, this is an example that we saw that was 1,800 square feet, uh, 1,200 square foot house, three bedrooms, one and a half baths. Uh, this one actually didn't have a garage, it just had a driveway alongside the house for parking. Um, and again, the landscaping was quite extensive, which currently we don't have landscape standards for single-family neighborhoods. Um, we're going to go this route, we have to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, we, we're just going to get smaller lots and not a better product. Yes. Yeah, so th this is another one at High Point. This was uh, 3,400 square feet. The last one was, was uh, an affordable unit rather than a market rate unit. This was a market rate unit in High Point. It was an 1,800 square foot house on 3,400 square foot lot. A one-car alley road loaded garage, but extensive landscaping. And then there was the townhome examples, which these are three stories, so they're, they're probably taller than uh, what we would currently allow. But on a 1,073 square foot lot, um, you've got a 1,300 square foot house, two beds, two and a half baths, and a one-car garage with extensive landscaping. And I'll, keep in mind, all of these neighborhoods have on-street parking, and so the fact that they have a one-car garage, and typically these ones don't even have a, and they only have one off-street space. The Mill Creek one had one in the driveway, one in the garage. Um, but in any event, uh, it's it's pretty in line with the parking These areas. communities, though, have transit networks that we don't have. Right. That's true. Yeah. And, and where this is, I mean, the bulk of the developable land is in the McCormick communities. Correct. And transit doesn't serve it. So, so the car... Well, we only require two spaces right now. So yeah. our, our parking minimum is two. So the Mill Creek example would be allowed from a parking standpoint. Okay. Um, this this is less than what we allow, and that's not something that I would recommend. Um, do, do they actually um, limit street parking in the front? Oh, yeah. On well, on private roads, for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's an issue. I mean, we deal with parking enforcement all the time, where the HOA is supposedly doing it, but then they don't really want to do it aggressively, and then we end up with these, like at Rutherford, where we have this parking situation. So, do you think at Rutherford? You meant Strathmore, or Strathmore, a couple years ago, Strathmore. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So it, it's, and then we have the, the stuff like stage court stuff in town that's a continual. We have a lot yeah, of that's garage, garage that mm -hmm. just, nobody's garages or garages. Yeah, at least it's a transit stop at the end of the street. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 So, yeah. It, and that just isn't our, what I'm concerned is, I, I love what I'm seeing mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. We just need, we're not ready I'm not, lowering, I'm not proposing the lower park, parking standard. That would be my concern. I would, in fact, emphasize that we should be requiring the creation of the on-street parking as part of the subdivision. Obviously, McCormick has its own road standard, but other subdivisions, it should be parking on both sides with two cars minimum per house, and that way you don't have these subdivisions. And you should be providing old school parking as well. I mean, a lot of these people start off with... Well, no kids, mm -hmm. and then suddenly they got four kids and four cars. Well, but part of the problem, too, is that we allow, when you have front driveways versus rear driveways, you're you're consuming that on-street parking. And so part of what we're going to talk about in the Coinbase Code is minimum lot width relative to the width of the driveway, and that when you don't have a driveway, you get a narrower lot because you have more on-street parking. And when you do have a driveway, the lot has to get wider to allow for additional cars to park on the street. And so it's, it can be variable. So I'm just thinking, you went to McCormick Woods mm -hmm. looking at this, and my mind went to the development um, on the west side of Bethel. And out here? Well, any of those places, as that there's there's land there. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And, 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 and there is planning there. I can see mm -hmm. this going in those types of... Because of the townhome town type stuff. Right, because we have transit along Bethel. Yes. Well, and, and also, I mean, McCormick North, which they're talking about potentially applying for a new development as opposed to using their existing best development, because they, I mean, that included industrial, uh, right. an industrial park there, which they don't see in their plans anymore. So they're looking at revamping that, and if they had to meet a new standard, it could include some of these things, provided that it had on-street parking to supplement the off-street parking. And then 
if they build an urban village, I think transit will look at probably serving that. Well, and it's not that transit won't serve that. We, we're, we're challenged from the standpoint, we, we can't be, there aren't enough people wanting to ride the bus out there. So we can't drive around a, a bus through McCormick Woods looking for people to get on the bus, and that's why we've gone to the dial-a-ride service. And so if dial-a-ride gets to the level where it makes sense that we're going to run a bus route through there, we'd rather around have routed bus through there. We just got to figure out what that is and where the demand is. There isn't sufficient demand right now. Yeah. But I'm I'm liking those to try to figure out how to use them within the yeah. city. So so this is you know we have a conventional zoning code and what I'm talking about is moving in the direction of a form based code. And so these are two definitions of or this is a definition of a form based code that contrasts with our our existing code and a form based code focuses on standards that create desirable and compatible buildings within a specific area with more of an emphasis on mass and scale and less of an emphasis on the actual uses of, of the brand. Um, and so I want to show you um, uh, an example from this model code that, that I mentioned. HUD prepared this document. They, they awarded the grant to the Teton Valley area of Idaho, which is two cities and the county, and they wrote a unified code they dealt with the rural areas and the urban areas and standardized all of the development regulations between the two using form as a, as a driving force. Um, they have what is in, and the thing I'll say about this is they, this document is, is as much an exercise in planning as it is graphic design. They've done such an outstanding job of communicating this information to the public. It makes things easy to read. Um, the problem is, is that it's, all done in InDesign, which is a, a graphic design software that none of my staff is, would, we could do this in, and it would take about three years to pull it out, so we to, to put together the formatting here. And so if we wanted it to look like this, it's going to have to go to a graphic designer, but we can at least take the content and the imagery and, and try to do the best that we can given uh, our existing constraints and how we, we format them. Cost? Huh? Cost to this. I don't know. If we, if we contract with the consultant who did this for HUD, um, it would probably be not too bad. I mean, $20,000, $30,000 uh, to have them update everything. But we're changing enough of, of the code, or we're looking at, you know, they're dealing with two very small towns. One of them is Driggs, Idaho, which I think is 4,000 people. The other one was what, uh, I forget the other name of the town. And they're outside of Yellowstone, so they're kind of gateways to the National Park, where you have a lot of tourists who come through there, but it's... Um, you know, there's not, a, there's not a ton of development on that side of the, the park compared to, to Jackson, Wyoming. What would you want to use instead of InDesign, like Publish or you know, I, Word? Or? So we send everything to code publishing and Word. And if, if we were to go this direction, I think what we'd end up doing is adopting a zoning handbook that would be in our code by reference, and it would be a standalone document that you would have to click on a separate link on our, our code to get to it, and it would open as a PDF that would be very clean and well laid out. Their, their code is even color coded. It's coded so all the headings on all the pages are, you know, red for commercial and um, it matches their zoning map colors and it just, it's, it's really clean and slick. But, um, like I said, that's probably beyond what, what we can reasonably accomplish. So anyway, the, the zone that they have that's closest to our R8 zone is, is what we're calling RS3, which is single family uh, and two family development. And so it, the zone is intended to accommodate single-family detached houses with a minimum lot size of 3,000 square feet. Additional building types that are allowed include backyard cottage ADUs, cottage court, duplex, and attached house townhomes. Uh, and it would be applied uh, in areas where it's predominantly single and two-family uh, houses. And they mentioned water and sewer service because they're a rural county where I think septics are more common. Of course, we wouldn't need to mention that in our code because we're all on sewer uh, within the city. Um, and in uses that would substantially interfere with the residential nature of the district are not allowed. Then they go into lot dimensions, and they actually deviate, depending on the type of building that you have, of the minimum lot size varies. And so this is the big difference. We have one lot size that fits all uses. They have a minimum lot size and a minimum lot width that varies depending on the, the actual form of the building that you're seeking to construct. Um, this is here a lesser maximum coverage, we have 75. Yeah, and I'm, you know, given our stormwater requirements, they don't have the same type of stormwater manual that we do. I don't even know that we need a maximum lot coverage because our stormwater manual dictates um, that they're going to use LID and, and uh, have stormwater facilities.
that they say are going to, you know, not be part of that glass coverage calculation. But it also mentions that glass less than 40 feet in width, even though it can go smaller, are required to take access from the rear the rear alley, except for a cottage course, which are one of their, their building forms. Then they have, um, the other thing that they do that's different than us is they have setbacks for the primary building and the secondary building, which basically means that the accessory structure can't go in front of the house. It has to be in the backyard rather than being uh, alongside the house or in the front yard. So the setback from the primary street to the main building is 15 feet or 40 feet for an accessory structure. And the, then the side and rear setbacks for the accessory structure lets you push a shed or a, a detached garage closer to the side property lines than what is required for a main house. And so it, it's a little bit more targeted in terms of, of what's allowed and, and where. Uh, additionally, they have height limits for accessory structures and principal buildings, and so um, we're at three stories and 33 feet, they're at three stories and 35 feet, so it's not, not a huge difference, but they do limit accessory structures to 24 feet. We could further limit things, you know, we're talking about detached garages on small lots, you could further limit those to 15 feet so that you're not ending up with a huge shadow on a small lot in a, you know, where you're going to cast a shadow on somebody, you know, your neighbor's property. The other um, thing then that they do is, is not only, uh, that was just the zoning standards applicable to the particular zone, then they have standards that apply to a building type. And so when you look at it, this is a, a household living, single family detached is the use, the building type is a detached house, and they have specific standards for um, for a house that may differ from other type building types that are allowed in that zone. And so a house can be three, three stories, 35 feet. Um, there are provisions for allowing uh, porches and balconies and stoops to project into, into the front yard. You have to go to a different section to find those. And then they talk about where parking can be located relative to that structure type. Then if you go into, this is another housing type. This is also single family detached as the use of that building type is a cottage court. And this is small cottages clustered around a common open space. This is actually an example in Redmond that they uh, used in their code. And it allows for up to five to nine cottages to be clustered together around a common area with a common parking area. And so it still allows you to have a detached house, but it can be served off of one street with a, a little parking area that's separate from the individual houses rather than everybody having a garage. And here, when you look at the, the site area, this actually requires 22,500 square feet to do a cottage cluster. And so there's a minimum site area, and then there's a, also a minimum lot area, meaning that each house can only be, they, they typically subdivide these so that each house is on 1,200 square feet, and then the entire site is 22,500 square feet, and is managed by the HOA. So this is a, a form that allows for... But each of them are owned, what they call... Yep, they're, they're individually owned, and everybody has their building and the setback for the building as something that they control, and then the rest of it is... Uh, is common. Uh, moving on, you know, they have a, a fourplex as a, a building type as well, and this is the use then would be multifamily, and they have a, they do multifamily three to four units, and then five to six units, and then six plus, because um, they correspond with different, with different building types. And so a fourplex, they're saying that you really need 7,000 square feet to build a fourplex, which is you know, at 80 per acre, our code says that to build a fourplex, you would need 20,000 square feet. And so it's reasonable to expect that you can build a fourplex on 7,000 square feet, a minimum lot with a 65 feet, um, and then you have the same height limits as a single family house, but there are, um, there's some transparency requirements for the, the amount of windows that you have to have. And so the, I think what this illustrates is that we may have a zone that allows a, a fourplex, but because it requires so much land to build a fourplex, nobody's ever going to build one because they can build four, you know, 3,000 square foot houses in that same location. And so it's, it's sort of limiting the creation of these alternative housing types. Uh, finally, going on to townhomes, um, townhomes require a minimum site area of 5,000 square feet. You can cluster between um, three and six townhomes together in one building, so it's uh, obviously, two units would just be a duplex, but as soon as you have the third one, it's a, it's a townhome. And a townhome is, is defined as being vertic separated vertically by a common wall, but not stacked, so there's no vertical mix where you have one unit on top of another. They're, they're just vertical units. And they can have these simple ownership 
Yeah, the zero lot line, correct. And so um, the site area is 5,000 square feet, but the lot area is 1,500 square feet. And so that gives you a little bit of a front yard, a little bit of a backyard. But again, we allow townhomes in R8, but it says that you have to have 1,500 square feet. And so if you build a 30 foot wide unit, you're talking about, you know, 100, what, 140 feet foot lot, which somebody who wants a townhome probably doesn't want to do yard work uh, to the extent that somebody who buys a single family house with one. So again, this, this allows for um, all of these different building types and set standards that are individual to the structure rather than a uniform zoning standard that tends to lend itself purely to single family construction. And so our proposal would be to, to take this Teton Valley model code and sort of adapt it for Fort Orchard and find, you know, where we have our eight zones, find the corresponding zone in the model code tweak it for any subtleties that are, so that people aren't seeing a major change in, in terms of what their zoning would allow, but really make the code work uh, to accommodate the uses we currently allow, but, but don't actually get built because of the, the constraints on development. And so that's just kind of an overview of, of how the model code works. Um, we wanted to introduce this to, to the planning commission, and if council feels comfortable moving forward with this approach, um, I think it's a good one. And, um, we need money in a budget, though, because we're going to need to have landscape standards designed. Well, the, the landscape standards are, are not, there's a landscape code as part of this, so. Okay. Um, if all, the only thing you need money for is if you want to have Correct. graphically just presented in a way that is more user friendly. But in terms of putting it in Word, I mean, Terry and I have already gone through the documents. So we can implement this without having to. Correct. Yeah, this is okay. zero cost to the city. This is just what we would do as staff between now and you know, I don't know, this summer when we might have something ready to be considered. Um, what about the park conference at Planet? Is that something we're going to be able to, I know, I'm going down a different rabbit hole. Is that something we can do in-house, or do we need a consultant for that, too? I would recommend a consultant only because um, of the impact fees that is needed and also the, the type of outreach that we need to do to figure out the level of service standards. I mean, we have nationally adopted standards in our code that are, this is how many tennis courts you should have per, per thousand people. And we have all these numbers, but we don't actually know um, what our community members want. And, and so I think there's a certain degree of outreach that is needed in developing the heart plan that realistically, given our limited staff, we, we would have a hard time facilitating those types of things. But it's from a management of yeah. staff time here, I know that once we build this McCormick Village Park, we don't have any capital projects, and we've got a park impact fee that, that needs, you know, needs to be justified from what we're putting resources to. I need to leave, but my comment on what we just saw is what I heard is that we have expectations now of what buildings might happen in our city, within our city, but our zoning doesn't realistically those any other any other product type other than a three thousand right. square foot house. Right. So we need to do something different, and this makes sense. Well, we saw this a couple months ago. Right? I, I kind of introduced you to it informally, and it was said pretty impressive. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. easy to read and understand. I don't have a problem with this. So. And I can show you. Do you do a you doing a service creation? It's do a thing with your. Nobody can talk to me about the capital facility. <laughs> we are right. We are right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Yes. Well, he'll want to be here, right? Yeah. Yeah. We. I mean, we can certainly help with that. Take part of it, but the input has to come from uh, council and public works on what projects have to go in there. So, um, and that would be a subsequent comp plan amendment because we haven't. We don't have anything to consider. Right now. Well, the tablets are already part of this repair by the planning department, so. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Hint, hint. Okay. I think it's just too long. We'll, we'll take that up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I guess I showed this. Right. Yeah, so anyway. Um, I like it. I also see it as a, as a way to encourage maybe redevelopments on the area west of Sydney, between Fremont and Kendall. That's a lot of kids, the way to develop between the courts, between the county's administration building in Sedgwick and the 
to create some sort of infill development mm-hmm. in areas where you have, you know, smaller or, or Perfect. Okay. you know, I don't think it's architecturally significant as what you have on the, the slope above downtown. Um, and so some redevelopment there, and specifically, I mean, I could imagine towns around the perimeter of given field where they, they mm-hmm. really frame a, a nice street there. Mm-hmm. And um, like should address affordable housing, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then that's walkable to the... Yeah, the street is quite transparent on Sydney. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, on Bethel, how, how are we going to develop Bethel? Uh, and if we're thinking about doing something different than trying to attract a box store, which probably isn't going to be realistic, that what type of... What type of development do we want there? And I don't think it's three four thousand square foot homes. Mm-hmm. I'd rather see apartments on Gumbleton than the Phillips because I don't know how we can make that happen. Yeah. Well, and, and there's that area on. It might be yeah. accurate. Mm-hmm. So the well, south we don't want them on Phillips is what I'm saying. Oh, you don't have any control. Yeah. Over that. So the south of Sedgwick, where there's a lot of undeveloped land, if we do a sub area plan, you know, one of the things that I think would be helpful is number one, program street connectivity, and then program building types, and so that the sub area plan actually says that we would like to see this building form in this location rather than just saying, we want this zone which allows a variety of building types. So we can actually get down to the building level in a, in a planning exercise. I think how we can combat that is making our land within the city more desirable and giving more tools and opportunities, yeah. and that's how we can attract it, and then it won't go into the county. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, the biggest challenge with this, and Terry and I have been talking about this, is that if we change the name of the zone from R8 to something else, and people get a notice in the mail that their zoning is changing, I think that they have the potential to be threatened, even though substantively... Do we keep it R8 and just change the form of it? Um, I thought about that a lot. I mean, R8 corresponds to a, a density requirement, and so I think by keeping the name and then saying actually the number associated with it <laughs> doesn't really mean anything. Or the R4.5, which never even corresponded to 4.5 units per acre, to me it's easier just to go R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and have different zones. And the 3, 4, 5 would actually correspond with multifamily height limits. Um, and so that way at least it means something. And then if we wanted to have a McCormick zone, R6 could be McCormick and R7 could be like a historic designation. But 1 and 2 would be the low density um, districts. So I, I think we would have to put together a public participation plan that says something along the lines of, you know, we will notify somebody if, if not just because the title of their zone is changing, but they will get a mail notice if their zoning is actually changing in terms of going from what is currently R8 or would be R2 to, you know, R3 or 4 or 5 where it's going to have an impact and then we would do, we would do mailing notices. I think it's going to require a lot of public participation. Yes. Do you think we're changing the name of the zone, or are we changing the actual potential density of the zone as well? Well, mm-hmm. I think we are. We're not changing the potential building types in the zone. But we are changing the potential density yeah. because we're adjusting the, the building form so that a town home doesn't have to be 140 foot deep. What about something like low, medium, and high instead of one, two, and three? Or I don't think that's low. a... I don't think well, we're subjective. Low, medium, high typically refers to density, and we're getting away from density to the basis for our differentiation. So um, the other thing that we thought of was that for established neighborhoods, we could create a zoning code A and a zoning code B, and zoning code A for existing neighborhoods that are R8 and have been built, we keep our existing zoning regulations and don't change them at this time, but we stop updating the development regulations, and so if if somebody wants to redevelop, they need to come and apply for a rezone to come in under the new code, which would be adopted parallel as, you know, to the existing zone. But then, then you have two huge sets of regulations in your code that just you I like this form base. I like the direction you're trying to make I love to put, yeah. Okay. Well, we will continue working on this and um, introduce it to the Planning Commission and um, once we have a draft and a public participation plan, we'll move forward with some public outreach. Perfect. Okay, we have a couple more minutes to require for these. So, Fred, do you want to go into uh, uh, yeah, transitory these, accommodations? Both of these items I just wanted to bring up as potential discussion items for this committee. The transitory accommodations code is something that I was suggesting that we look at and decide if the city wants to do it or does not want to do it. It seems to be in limbo, and I've heard, um, for example, the commissioner say that the city has not yet adopted, and I thought, well, 
I don't know that we are going to adopt something that's been up at the council problem, but we can help. Six or more years ago, and there was no appetite at all in our community. Well, I think we should just be able to give a definition of that one. We've looked at it recently. We do or don't want to do it. Um, I think I, well, I've, I've met with the county staff pretty extensively, and what they've actually established is a temporary use code which differs from a permanent use code. We really don't deal with temporary uses in the city because it's, it's, we can define something as temporary, but the impacts for a period of time are going to be the same as if the use is permanent. And so how do you, do we really want to go down the path of, of requiring less mitigation to develop a temporary use if it's only going to be there for two or five years? And what happens if they want to make it permanent? Are we going to make them come back and comply with additional standards as part of making something permanent? And I think our position is just been, it's better just to treat everything as if it's permanent and, you know, find long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. I just think it would be nice if you would say, we've looked at it and we're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's been seen by some as a way to evade public participation, and I don't think we're for that. Um, it seems to have some in it, uh, but... Yeah. But we should, you know, look at it and say, we don't recommend going further or something to the the record. Um, with parking, this is a much longer issue, but what I've noticed is that I think both also and Bremerton have done parking studies. I don't know that you're there yet, but I think we might, it's something that we should at least talk about, but what does downtown need in terms of parking? Um, I don't want to necessarily say that we need to build a parking garage, but I've, I've thought that perhaps there are sufficient spaces that people don't know about it, so it could be maybe a map or an awareness campaign? Uh, uh, I think you put that out. No. They did a inventory of everyone's parking, including businesses. Mm -hmm. What I'm thinking is more at a consumer level, like this is where commuters can park, this is where shoppers can park. They included like, oh, here's where businesses park. And I don't think that I, I don't know. I don't I think it's pretty obvious where people can park. I um, think our, our I think our challenge what we need to address is We've got this MUP program, and we've relaxed parking standards. We have a residential parking program that we're not going to want to incorporate in that, or we're going to, or we will create a severe parking problem. So I think we need to amend our code to so that these folks that are you know, they're going to build on 640 Day Street or a project out of West Bay, uh, potentially, or any any of these other sites that. Um, you know, if, that, if they say they're going to build to the market, what the market demands is one stallish, you know, our code saying a half stall. We can have somebody that comes in and proposes to comply with our code at a half stall, and these folks that buy and move into these places need to know that they're not going to get a residential pass to park on the street. That these are transit-oriented developments, and it is intended you know, I, you're, I, not, you're I, not going to have a problem. I'm uncomfortable with that, and I agree with that. What I'm thinking of more is that is there a way that we can address the issue where people say there's no parking for the commercial court of that street? That's a that's fallacy. Yeah, that's what I hope. Well, I, I don't disagree, but I, I think that we, it's, we need to educate them where the place is. Fred, I don't think there is an education need. I attend the merchants Association meetings and the chamber meetings, and I don't hear it. There are two or three business people downtown, and there's two or three offenders and their employees that park in front of their doorsteps all the time. Yes. No, what I'm thinking is more of a problem. Potential consumers that don't even come downtown because they think Walmart you see all the space. It's, it's a perception thing. I agree that there's plenty of places parking down, but we people don't realize that they avoid downtown because they think there's no place to park. I, but I believe that's a fact. I think you might avoid downtown for some reason to be downtown. Yeah. You think what? I think they avoid downtown for there's no compelling reason to be downtown. That's not true, but it's, it's just chicken and egg thing. Yeah. I think they can't feel, even you know, if I wanted to go to comic book stores, there's no question. From place. behind the market all the way up to the pavilion, there are empty slots in there. Mm -hmm. Tons of empty The best thing we could do for our parking, if if you there was perceived a parking problem, is combating chain parking. That, that, is, that is what happens and happens at the courthouse is people park and then they park for a few hours and they move their car. Uh, it, it, we're talking about a $15,000 investment into some hardware and software that goes on the parking enforcement vehicle. So it drives along and it reads license plates. And so we would have to change our code to combat that, that it will require a policy decision 
to and back in and some of well, I'm just hoping that we can talk more about this parking issue. We don't have to solve it now. But well, I would agree with what Roger said, too. As things like 640 come up, I think that it's the future of parking. I mean, it needs to be a part of our development plans. I mean, right now, I mean, I hope we do have more and more compelling reasons for people to be living downtown and for them to be, you know, uh, being a part of an economy downtown. And at that point, you know, we need a plan for that. This your guys have a committee. You can talk about what you want, but I think that's a waste of time. Well, and I think one easy way to do this is if you wanted to just say, did you know, put a Facebook post out that says there are this many two hour spaces, this many, right? I mean, you can, you can make 10,000 people right there saying this is how much more we can do. The problem is that people that come into downtown and I experience this Saturday with my wife because everybody thinks that Bay Street is where all the parking is. And they go down and there's no parking on Bay Street. They have no idea that because we drove around in, you know, on the Amy side and there was there were loads of parking spaces, but there wasn't a single space on Bay Street, and there's well, maybe it's signage. We could it. actually, uh, we think we could get rid of parking on Bay Street. You could do not visible. You know, maybe that's the solution. You don't have a lot of parking on Bay Street. So yeah, so people would have to know there's another place. Right? Do they have a bad as it were very parts? That's an interesting idea. You know, I didn't mean to like. No, that's like rainbow thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I, I, we ran an exact situation. I was like, there's no place to park. And she yeah. was trying to squeeze in here. I'm like, there's no way to parking. There's four hour parking behind the market. Four hour parking. I, you know, I had to maybe loop once, but I can, I've can never yeah, had that We're not the audience that I'm worried about, not because, you know, I don't even park them. It's yeah. the people that come into town. Yeah. Or it's 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 perception, yeah. Fred. And, and, yeah. and when somebody says it, you say, there's plenty of parking. There's over a thousand stalls. So that's just what the answer in conversation is just changing the mindset. Well, mm-hmm. this is in our public event toolkit. It says these are available parking spots. And so mm-hmm. we educate them where they can park and where they can tell people to park in our mm-hmm. event. Now, how we deal with the half stall with the people that have the family and they're now in 640 Bay in the park and they got two kids and right. six cars. Or yeah, that's the issue. Well, that's their decision to rent there. Exactly. Yeah. And they can just see that move pretty quick, too. Yeah. Because they don't want to build the trail. Is that down half hour from two hours? It varies. Two hours. I did this on Eighth Street. It's two. Other than a few yeah. 30 minute load. On. I mean, there is a way to create higher turnover on Eighth Street if, if you want people who want to park for more than for two or more hours to go around. I mean, putting Eighth Street at one hour would certainly make more on street parking. The, rest, the restaurant community doesn't want that. And, and no. Yeah. An hour's not enough to go in and get But that's so since that they think the only place to park to eat at the restaurant is on Bay Street. So I think that's a good idea is like eliminate all parking on Bay Street. <laughs> like, there are parking rules behind the buildings. You know, the, the people do think they have the sense that Bay Street is where you park. Um, are the merchant are all the merchant stalls we used to have those merchant stalls in the permits? They could, there's, there's capacity. That, that's what part of the problem is, too. If you're supposed to park in front of the doorstep, you need to park in the merchant lot. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Walk, 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 walk park in front of other merchants. Most of them. Yeah. All of them. Most logical businesses. Most of them. Most of them. Most of them. You leave yeah. parking for your customer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Are they moving their cars for a few hours? Yeah. yeah. The employees yeah. are parking. Yeah. That's not a ticket. And, and yeah. no. Yes, and no. Just quick. When I just met with Noah, I walked over here this morning with we're figuring it out. So we opened bids on McCormick Village Park and Well Nine, and um, we have financial challenges. So we're we have well, so we're half a million dollars short on McCormick Village Park, but if we don't build it, we walk away from a three hundred thousand dollar grant. So um, we're looking. It's most likely the solution to raise money um, on that one, and then uh, Well Nine, we're about three hundred and change short. So yeah, and um, well, there's a fund for the others, too. There's money. So we just always say they didn't spend that money. Got a million four and read two. And 300,000 and, and read one. So. Okay. So there'll be more 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 the pocket park is on the, in the prime? Yeah, it's probably the most added right now. So. Okay. Anything else that we go to the order? Or we go ahead and... Oh, do we know 703 Pitch Shop is in foreclosure at this house? Okay. Who's out? The one that's burned yeah. out. The burned out. Actually, I heard that the bank, um, bank has taken possession of it, and I think 
that was telling me that eventually they're just going to list it, but it's just working through their, their process. They secure the building, and so, it should be coming to market. Okay. Well, yeah, that's complete. I think the bank now owns it. Um, it's just a matter of them. Yeah. 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 Let's go to the meeting. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>